How are we doing, you? I'm doing very well, thank you, Sean. How are you? I'm all right. That was uh, that was a enjoyable, slightly disappointing review, but uh, I, I'm, I did enjoy it. Disappointing doesn't mean I didn't like it, and I I'm not in wasn't happy with every second of it, but uh, wasn't what I thought. So it's interesting how you have these expectations and things look a certain way when you're a kid, and you you see something as an as an adult. It's it's so difficult to, I guess, to put those things aside and to just make a black and white decision on something. Well, look, I, I've. I've now watched a, an episode of the Dukes of Hazard, so I don't think I would ever have happened without this um, this no. podcast that we're doing. So yeah, it was fun to actually watch an episode. Um, yeah, it kind of didn't blow me away, but I liked certain elements of it, and I wouldn't be totally against watching another one either. And I can mm. see why people liked it. There, there was enough mm. of it in that, but it didn't it didn't blow me away. But Hello, I just enjoy doing the process. It's fun mm. watching an old episode with a buddy and just commenting on it and uh, reliving the good old days. I, I, when I, when I see these now, the more that we watch these, it really um, takes me back. And I'm somebody who I do probably spend too much time on my phone or looking at screens. And it's not that I don't enjoy that, but when I watch these older shows, it makes me think back to those days that I can remember when there were no phones and no things to look at. And it's it's such a simple time when when you yeah. look at you know just the cars they're driving around and they just had radios with dials and no digital layouts and, and you know er everything was just mechanical um it just it's just really cool to see those older sets and and you know just sort of put yourself in in that position and what it's like to live like that well i i i mentioned it off uh camera before and i'd like to you know put it to you i suppose on camera now that the the documentary the social dilemma which is on netflix currently is mm. fantastic and it yeah. talks about the age of technology and social media and its impact on society and i'm not going to give any other spoilers outside of that it's just a great watch and mm. um yeah it kind of goes into some of that stuff and yeah so to, to backtrack onto these old tv programs it's it's something just really heartwarming about watching mm. what life was like back in the day. And um, it makes me feel good watching it. There's something yeah. reassuring about it, weirdly, because it's behind and our world is nowhere. It's not like that anymore, which I suppose you could get sad from, but I don't. I, I feel, I don't know, it's like a nice warming feeling when I watch these shows. Mm. Well, I think the technology we have now is, is important to us. It, it benefits us. You know, I do like having connection with with people yeah, very sure. quickly. Um, but it, I, I wonder if if we look at what history is, I was thinking about this the other day. And one of the interesting things about history, uh, interesting is OK, not interestingly. So for anybody who didn't watch the review, I'm trying to not say interesting or interestingly so much because I said it so many damn times. I just want to make it a thing. So I'm embarrassed about it. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating uh Nice. That's see, that's you know, I use that word and it's not at all gonna work with the sentence that I was putting together. Um run with so it, I was just, go with it. So what was so fascinatingly interesting about thinking about those interesting, fascinating times in history, uh, is when you look at things such as you know, not so much the Wild West, but medieval times or Roman times, what makes history so interesting and in finding you look at was it Mount Vesuvius that blew no, it's um what's the um the volcano that exploded Pompeii. So you that, look that at Pompeii, was previous, wasn't it? Yeah. So if you look at Pompeii, what is so interesting for people <laughs> looking at that is you can see a, a snapshot of somebody at the moment that they they've died. Now it's not it's morose, but it, it's the idea that you have a, a tangible, visible depiction of something back then, and you don't get that. Uh, in relation to 60s, 70s, and 80s. So if you move forward 200 years, there's not going to be any question as to what type of clothing people wore or what the style was or how people behaved because there's digital depictions of it. Whereas with you know Roman times or, or you know ancient Egypt, there's some level where we have to read the tea leaves and, and try to, to delineate this information. That's gone. We, we now have a living... Uh, recording of everything that's gone on in history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that makes. Uh, go on. 
I was going to say, well, if you look at, um, I know it's not uh, actual history of the world, but Game of Thrones, uh, if you look at the popularity of that show, for me, that a lot of that is down to somewhat trying to envision what it was like maybe in that type of time period in a less fantastical way, you know, castles and, and the monarchy. Uh, and, and I think there's some people like those historical pieces because it gives you a better idea of things you can't normally see. It puts you yeah. in that position. And I don't it, think it, that's, it, yeah. It aids with the fantasy creation, like mm. the world creation, I think, because it is so um, unimaginable and we don't know that time. It's easier to kind of add in dragons and all the other kind of mystical stuff that kind of goes along with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I just keep thinking that's not something we are in, in 200 years time. They're not going to, nece- they're still going to have history. I mean, there's still going to be, you know, people fascinated by the history of ancient Egypt, for example, but it's just not the same. History is not the same. And even as digital media gets gets better, I can't imagine what it's going to be like in 40 years' time. Because if I think about video from 40 years ago, hell, Nick and I were watching golf. And in, in it, we were watching, ended up paying an extra five or a month or something to upgrade to Sky Golf HD because we were struggling to watch it in non HD. And it's no place. It's, it was, you know, my wife. She's not like a, not uh, like your wife. Yeah, so it, but it bothered her to the point. It was kind of blurry that just in the last five years, TV has gotten so clear that we struggled to watch the the golf from five years ago on on non HD television. So I can't imagine what it's going to be like in fifty years time. How they're going to view the content that we're putting out and the clarity we're putting out, and, and how much better that's going to get. Yeah, it, it, it's it fascinates me, and it's part of the kind of. I suppose there's a little bit hesitant with it as well as like, it isn't all positive for me. It's, it's mainly positive, like of, of where we're going with that front. But I, I imagine that you'll basically have something that's indistinguishable from actually being there. You, you, it would be like you are actually in front of that person or that front of that view that you're watching. Um, maybe even more immersive as well. They'll try and input stuff with, where you have you wear things and because i've already seen my friend who's quite into tech as well got this music device where you plug it in and it, it kind of vibrates on beats and you know mm. like when the light and noises you kind of vibrate like so imagine maybe smells or there's some environmental like when you you know like air coming out when you're outside or something like that i'm trying to think of what where else they can take the senses mm. because we've got quite a high level of both visual and, and audible. So um, I think the, the the visual will go to another level, but they'll probably try and put in some other metrics as well. But um, yeah, the, the tech side of it, it is it is it is fascinating because of how much things change in five years, 10 years. So yeah. 40 years, you know, when we're, when we're coming to the end of our days, like what is it going to look like? It's, yeah, well, that, uh, there's no way we can comprehend it. No, I, 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 what I, one thing I was surprised never really took off. I I'm still into this idea is sporting events on VR goggles. It was something that was happening, but I've not. It's not a thing. It's nothing. You know, we, we don't see the the major. You know, um, if we look in the states, ESPN or uh, Sky Sports here, it's not like a major thing. I think it was something they were doing in the Olympics. I don't know why that didn't take off. I thought that was a great idea. Are you in the crowd then? Are you, are you like yes. a, a seat in the stadium? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, the I, idea being you put on the VR goggles, you sit down on your sofa and you look around and you see all the views from the camera, the camera right. angles. So I look left and right. I see the scoreboard up there and I see, you know, the the if I'm watching a basketball game, I see the end of the court that's not being played on. I'm just looking around because the VR goggles, I haven't been on VR goggles, but from what I understand, they're quite good. Yeah, I, I've I've not either. I've only done it at a friend's house with a video game, and uh, that was insane playing Resident Evil with VR goggles. Um, oh wow! Uh, so yeah, from a sport perspective, I, I don't know that. The thing is, you've talked to someone that's got like I, I think a very different, maybe unpopular view on on sporting events. So I have been to a few sporting events, not that many, but enough that actually I prefer not to go to sporting events. I'm not a mm. massive lover of fans, uh, like fans of a crowd, I should say. I've got no problem with fans. Mm. I, I 
don't like massive numbers of queues and the kind of the rigmarole of that, the inefficiency of going to a game, maybe traveling a couple hours to get to it, queuing to get in, paying extra money to actually watch it when you can watch it for free or very cheaply on you mm. know technology. They're not having good views, not good angles and replays and stuff like that. So I'm really like, I'm a bit of a snowflake when it comes to that. I just, why not save all that time, all that money, all that effort. And they've got, you know, I can watch it at home, get all the commentary. I can rewatch things, rewind it, pause it. So I like all of that stuff. I actually prefer it. I could bring my own food to the table, invite friends, like people that I yeah. want to be here rather than random people I have no control over. So yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not as much of a live sports fan as as other people. To be fair, and I know that I'm in the minority. I think it depends on the sport, though. Um, Maybe. I think I think football is not as enjoyable. I was speaking to to a couple of my friends that I, that I play golf with, and we were talking about this. And I know I've spoken to you about this before, but football, one of the most popular sports in the world. I, I do like going to games and I'll go to games when it's a Wednesday night and it's a cup game against the team that nobody cares about. And I'll get seats, you know, down in front or up at the top row where there's nobody. Cause I like that space. Cause I do enjoy watching a live event. I think it's different to see, to see the actual, you know, to hear the actual, uh, the football against the, the, um, you know, the shoes and, and what do you call them over here? It's not cleats. I'd say cleats, the, uh, boots boots so here in the, the leather boots and the leather football cracking and you just see more of the actual game unfold when you're there live but yeah, i agree with true. you i agree with you when when you're there i think football is probably one of the best and worst sports to watch live because as a social event going with friends you really can't catch up with them easily so even if i go to a bar to watch football yeah. with, with friends <laughs> i i struggle with that i coming from america there's always a commercial break and I, you know, people used to make fun of me for that because I'm from America and, and we have commercial breaks every 20 minutes. But I found when I was hanging out with my friends, I never knew when I could get a beer and I never knew when I like if I'd used the toilet, I always had to run out and run in or wait for halftime. But American sports are set up quite socially. So you have those breaks to go. Did you see that? Couldn't do that watching a football game because That's you're true. almost like, leave me alone. I'm watching the game. I don't want to talk about the play that happened two minutes ago because something's happening right now. American football, for example, it stops every every few minutes, and you can go, wow, did you see that? Yeah, you shouldn't have done this. I thought he should have done that. What do you think they're going to do next? They're going to do this. Much more social sport. Yeah, no, I think that's really fair. Um, I'm a fight fan as well, so I love the UFC, and you've got that kind of similarity where you've got five-minute rounds, and then I think it's a minute on the clock or 30 seconds or a minute. Yeah. Um, so you get that little break in between. You can talk about what you've just seen before it kind of kicks in again. But, um, yeah, I've not really thought about that, but you're, you're spot on from the social side. Yeah. Cricket, uh, you can I, get away with it. Unless you're watching something I'm actually not too concerned with, and you can kind of comment throughout. And, you know, it's not, it's not like a... If it's a cracking game, it's it's hard to really talk. Like you said, it's just like silence. You're just watching it. You're engrossed with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I actually... Funny enough, mate, I pulled the trigger and finally got uh, the Now TV Sky Sports package, as in yesterday. Oh, wow. I think because of the whole lockdown thing as well, and I'm really yeah. enjoying watching football. And... Um, Sean will know this more than the viewers, but I don't really sign up for a lot of monthly stuff. I don't, you know, yeah. shell out payments and on and on luxuries and stuff like that. It's not really me, but I spoke to Lou about it and we were like, let's just, yeah, let's just do it. And um, we've just been really enjoying the last couple of days having football on, maybe even in the background as we're doing mm -hmm. things and talking. And there's something about sport that I just, again, find mm -hmm. really warming. And I, I, even if it's a game like right now, Man City are taking on Leicester. So, it's just nice to have that in the background, even though I don't really care about the result. Yeah, I so you so from when we were hanging out uh, yeah. a few years back, you were really into United, really into watching football. You went through a period where you it almost I don't know this is the case, but if you were to ask me, like if Nick were to say, "Oh, what's Nick think about?" Sorry, what's you think about football now? I would have said he really doesn't give a shit. He's not that fuss. I would even I would have even said you're if you were to say who you support, you would say well. You, you root for United, but you, you really have more important things going on than sport. And I, I is that still the case? Um, pro like the, the thing is when you, when you talk about supporting football, you, you get, you get lumped in with everyone else that kind of supports yeah. it. And when you're looking at it on that level, no, I don't care as much as the, the other Man United supporters um, or any other football supporters. It's, it's irrelevant. There's a Man United. Um, I, 
during the week I really focus on my work and in the evening I really love watching the football game. On weekends I do a little bit of work so um, not always but just so happens I'm not well at the moment. I just caught a little kind of um, snotty bug the last couple of days so I've been quite happy just switching off and watching sport mm. but do I care about it? The, the truth is mate, it's just really speak from the heart. When United are playing well when my team are playing well, I bloody love it. And I bloody love mm. watching a good game of football when there's good foot, they're attacking, there's counter-attacking, it's mm. going at each other. I love sport. What, you know, I'll watch any sport, to be honest, when it's like that. Mm. What I can't watch and abide by is, is watching some people that we know that are, are getting really good wages and they they kind of have these sub part efforts it's not like mm. their end result sometimes passes go astray and they make mistakes that's okay uh, that happens on every single sport but i can't abide watching people not try and then when you see a team uh, like united as well if you watched our first game of the season it was abysmal so mm. to watch your team you kind of like centered your day around and you sit there for an hour and a half two hours when you look at the pre and post match and you're watching a shit performance of people not really trying up to the pace looking like sunday league it's it's really hard to buy into that. Mm. And the problem is I'm an obsessive thinker. I'm someone that's all in. So when I do that, I end up getting pissed off and frustrated watching them. I find it hard to let go. So I've got to try and bridge a gap to stop myself getting wound up like it. Because my dad mm. used to just, my dad's welfare, he, uh, no joke, mate. My dad's welfare was all on sport and it got, it was really testing to be around. So if Tottenham played well and they won, he was glorious to be around. And if they played badly and lost, he was a nightmare to be around. He was sure he took out on everyone after. It was like, it was a bit of a joke in our household. So it was a bit of an aversion to be like that. So when they're playing badly, I just don't, I, like, I, you know, I find it hard. And I try and maybe stay away from it. So mm. having only had Sky now for a couple of days, and I should say it's just Sky Sports we've got, it's nothing else. I'm not interested in the rest of the channels. Um, you know, prior to that, we just don't really watch too much of it. So mm. I wouldn't get too invested in it. Um, but no, I, truth be told, I really would love to watch United all the time, play well and win. And I would be obsessed with it. Mm. It's just the fact they haven't been as good in recent times. And that's probably made me not want to watch it because my net result from watching it is being a little bit down the dumps or frustrated and all these things I can't control. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's that's been me pretty much. I, I'm such a silver lining person. Um, I guess for me, I, I, I support, I, I use the term because that's what people say here. I support Aston Villa, which means I follow them. I'm not a diehard Villa fan, but in, interestingly, I was going to say it. God damn it. Caught yourself. I know. Uh, I'm going to get better at it too. Um, I'm, I, I, I hope you don't mind me making it a point because it just got to make it stop. Um, <laughs> with uh, what I find... Uh, as a Villa fan saying I'm a Villa fan, it's a different thing here because I do a lot of reading and I know a lot about the players and I probably know enough that I could be considered a, a decent supporter, but I, I don't have that same emotional connection that people have to football here. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like that you have to have a specific level of buy-in to be considered a supporter or else you're a fair weather fan. There's no, there's an element of people that feel like you have to be all or nothing. And I, I don't know. It's something that I've not really, really understood because in America, when we look at, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the Eagles, Philadelphia Eagles. That is my, probably my favorite team of all the professional sports. And I know everything about them. I wouldn't say I'm emotionally invested, but I have to watch all of the games. I'm excited when they win. I love it. Even when they lose, I'll watch the games and I'll read up on it. But I'll I'll kind of take the good stuff from it. And then when things are bad, I won't read the news because people get dramatic about things. I won't go on Twitter to look at the – and I'll just think of something else. Be, ah, that's all right. Let me go focus on something else that makes me happy. This will be back again sometime, whatever. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, could, I could relate to some of that, mate. I, I think your first point on the diehard fa fans, this is where – well, I'm a little bit different to most people. Uh, like, it, I find it real cringy. People say that they die. You've got to, you've got to support a team through thick and thin. Uh, no, like it's an invest. My time is more important than what committing, regardless, a hundred percent to a team. If my team in particular are playing awful football and we've got a load of injuries, and I find it 
you know, I've I've purposely missed games because I'm just I just don't I just don't want to watch it. I've got more mm. important things to do in my life. Um, however, when we're playing well and I feel really great from watching that, then I watch it. I don't give two shits if people are like you are not a proper fan or whatever. Fuck you. Mm. I, don't, I don't really care what you think. Like yeah. I support Man United when you know it's it's more about me than it is about them. And you know, I'm not gonna um, mess my life up or, or mess my mentality up for for a game of football. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit here and just like um, pushing that point forward. But you you want a team to win, it, it, and it doesn't really matter. I think how hard you want that. There are some people that are more committed to Man United than me. That's fine. That doesn't make me less of a. Ma- mm. I'm a Man United fan. There was just different levels of commitment, and um, I don't think there's anything anything wrong with that i think it's just being honest really there are people mm. that it, you know it, when i watch you know like i i get influenced by what i watch right to the extent that where um i don't know if you've watched the true crime drama des this week about um yeah. uh, or, uh, two weeks ago dennis nielsen a serial killer so um i get fascinated watching that type of stuff but I don't like watching loads of it because it makes me feel crappy. It's a bit like it's a, it's like addictive watching it. And you watch it like, oh my God, these thrillers, horrors. But then at the end of it, you feel like, I'm just going to go and have a cold shower right now. It's not something you feel like, ah, oh. you know, it's like the opposite of watching the Dukes of Hazard. Mm. Um, so I get influenced by that. So my rule with me and Lewis, like I don't watch that stuff and then go to bed. I'll watch, I've got to watch something a bit more lighthearted before because <laughs> I just want to be thinking and dwelling yeah. on like the sickness of this individual and what they've done. Um, and so, in many ways, the sport is a, is a similar thing. Like, if it if something is is frustrating me and making me annoyed or anxious or whatever, then I'll just limit what I'm you know what I'm watching. And unfortunately, that's down to Man United, not me. I can't you know I know that I can control my own feelings, but I I don't I can watch United lose if they go and give it a hundred percent and they're outplayed. But yeah. When they go out and play and it's half ass and the other team is just wants it way more, like Crystal Palace did. I find it difficult to watch this. It, it, it feels pathetic. It feels weak. And then that, that's influenced by me. I'm like, I somehow attach myself to that and then feel that same kind of like, you know, that like kind of flatness. But actually the reverse happens when I watch a real brave, courageous performance and you lose or you come mm. back and you feel like, yeah, come on. Like you really kind of embody that. So like, again, I know that I'm more of an extreme person. And mm. Lou laughs at me because I do take on stuff like that. You know, yeah. I'll watch a, the last dance with Michael Jordan and I'll suddenly be like, God, I can take on the world. You know, like I'll embody Michael Jordan. <laughs> but the reverse happens too, unfortunately. If I watch something that's really like, I don't know, like sad or like, uh, I could kind of pick up some of those emotions too. So I, I, for those reasons, knowing what I'm like, I try and taper what I watch and when. I wanted to find for you, um, I don't know if I've ever so shown you this because this was. Uh, I'm going to go back to golf because we were watching the Tiger Woods story, and Tiger Woods is an interesting character. Um, he's such a driven individual, um, and he's he's much yeah. maligned. He's not a perfect individual, but I think he, for me, he represents somebody who hasn't been perfect. But he's not a. I don't think he's a bad person as well. But he he is somebody that much like Michael Jordan. I wanted to share this with you, and I'm kind of um, getting off the subject a bit, but. He did this interview before his first professional tournament. And, and as a professional golfer, when you first make the, the tour, you are going to toil and you are going to work hard and graft. Now, you get the few exceptions that come out, but Tiger Woods expected when he made the tour that he was going to win his first tournament. And he did an interview. It was with Curtis yeah, String. And it, like, it kind of got me excited because he was so unapologetically, oh, this is it. Um, yeah, stick it on. So let me pop this on. Let me find it here. Let's get it on the screen. And it's, it is the example of a winning mindset. This, this like just makes me want to run through brick walls. It's such a oh, simple I thing. Love this stuff. Yeah. And it's just like one sentence, but you can just see in his eye um, that this, this kid, he went in not accepting any compromise of any sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is it. This is it. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. This is always problematic. Share screen. Yeah, this is it. And this, e even even Nick, who's not like that into sport. I mean, she she really loves golf now. We watch golf, but 
th- this like it was just like wow this this guy is going to be something special what Can would you hear be that? a successful week here in Milwaukee? Yeah. A victory would be awfully nice. So hold on. I'm going to go back to this. This is before his first professional tournament. He's won as an amateur. He's an up-and-comer. People know that this kid is special. Curtis Strange is a seasoned veteran on tour, one of, one of the better golfers in the world. 17 tour events, I think it's saying he's won. So I'm going to just put that in context. Okay. What would be a successful week here in Milwaukee? A victory would be awfully nice. A victory. Mm. To me, that comes off as uh, a little cocky or brash. Well, I, when you come out here, you're fr- you know what I'm saying, your I'm first sure. pro tournament, and you say, you know, I can win. I've always figured that why go to a tournament if you're not going there to try and win? There's really no point in even going. I um, love that. attitude I've had my entire life, and that's the attitude I will always have. The second sucks. The third's even worse. Um, that's just a feeling But on I tour, have. that's not too bad sometimes, though. That's not too bad, but I've, I want to win. That's just my nature. You'll learn. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. I'm sorry I had to say that. <laughs> he went He went on to win, not that tournament, but he won more than any pro, I think, in his first year uh, on tour. And when I bit. see that, that just like, like I, I love a few things about that. I love that Curtis Strange, his like shock laughter when he said, I want to win. And Tiger didn't say that ironically. He's going in his first tournament to win as this kid coming onto the pro tour that is just, you know, chewed up and spit out some of the best players in the world. And if I, I'm sorry, we're talking about golf, but it's, it's relative to this Jordan, no, Spieth, for example, Jordan Spieth, for example, I'm sure you've heard the name was a golfer yeah. that was up and coming like him. And he is getting a lot of shit because he's going through a lot of trouble right now. Um, and was, you know, there was expectations. He was going to be that good. And when I saw that, it gave me just pinned, you know, like, chills watching it and it got me excited that whole idea that this is this is what i'm programmed to do i am here to win what's the point in showing up to a tournament if i don't fully expect to win and if i don't then i don't but why am i here if i'm not pushing myself to win and i just everything about that clip i love Uh, i i I live i live for that stuff i really do get uh, it, it it really does impact me probably more than it should or maybe more than other people but i absolutely love that stuff and i kind of i want that stuff for breakfast just keeping that type of mentality um i i'm really drawn to those type of individuals as well that have that level of confidence like it's yeah. just it's already done it's already done no matter what and i'll try and embody that in certain parts of my life as well and um I, I, you know, I think there's a, just a distinct difference why I've never heard heard of Curtis Strange, and why you know I've heard of Tiger Woods, and um, I think that mentality kind of sums them up. And that's not a dig at Curtis Strange; it's just showing the gulf between someone that's prepared on their first tournament to say I'm here to win, and he laughs yeah. at it. That's that's the difference between you and him, mate. And that's yeah. why he's up at four o'clock in the morning doing weights and working out because he'll do everything it takes to win, and and you won't. And uh, yeah. um, and again, that's not a dig. It's just saying like you're not the elite of the elite. He's um, he's uncommon amongst yeah. uncommon people, and that it's a special breed of people. And I, I I'm drawn to them. Yeah, and it's it's this look for me. I just love this because Curtis Strange. I do have a lot of respect for. Um, and he his point is not a bad point to make for for 99 of the population. He is saying exactly the right thing. No. Uh, but, that that's that is the problem with it that is yeah. and it isn't the problem with it he, what he's saying is a very standard average counter and what tiger woods is saying is the fucking elite cream of the crop answer that's the difference and there's yeah. there's no right and wrong that doesn't make him better or uh, so whatever as a person but as a as a golfer if you're listening to those people talk you're like who is your money on like it's a no-brainer yeah hey, i uh, looking at, at Tiger, and Tiger is an example of somebody that is so driven, it actually hurt his career. Uh, so he's won more majors than than most. He's not the, I think he's third all time. I think you have Jack Nicholas, Nicholas Arnold, still. Pa- yeah. Arnold, Arnold Palmer's up there. Um, uh, I, think, I don't know if Ben Hogan's up there as well. I, I'd have to look it up. But Tiger isn't the most prolific winner, but he is for yeah. his, that. What makes him incredible is he's on that list and he's only really played. I want to say maybe 12 full years of a professional career. 
before his driven nature, his obsession with, with being the best in perfection physically hurt him probably. So the work, he, he was obsessed, Tiger Woods, with being a, a, like SEAL training. And he, he had that obsessed he, – Tiger Woods is somebody that I think you would find interesting because a lot of the traits that you have, he has – to the nth degree. And, and he was just obsessed with exercising and obsessed to working out at it. One, like he was going to um, Paris Island, I think it is where the Marines train and he was going through whenever he could boot camp trainings and just trying to like push his body to the, to the edge so that he can be the best at what he does. And, you know, he, he had problems with painkillers after that because of the damage he did to his body and he had loads of surgeries and there's images. Have you seen the video? Uh, there's a, a, his last, I think his last win, he won with a, with a back injury. And every time he swung the club, he, he crumbled to the ground. Have, have you seen that? No. Nah. So this is Tiger. Um, let me find this one. Tiger wins. Mate, you have to look at the bar. Oh, yeah. Let me uh, just take that down for a second there. So Tiger wins. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, so this was um, – I'm going to share this. This this was uh, – pause this. I think he, I think he might have even won this one. Um, he, he just – he was in the lead by quite a lot, and, and this was where his career went. Um, actually, I'm going to share it with – so this, this is what Tiger was dealing with, and he was so driven – Yeah, I think he's leading at this point on the last day. Oh, that doesn't look good, is it? I think he went on to finish that and win. Um, and every, like he, he was just, you could see during that round, he was just trying to finish and win. And on the courses they play, so I played um, last weekend, I played Welsh, Welsh National Course. It's one of the best courses I've ever played. It's in the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, but one of the best courses, probably one of the hardest courses I've played, and it is a tour standard course. And the courses they're playing are no joke. They are hard just to get around and to have that back injury, just I know what that's like to be on the ground like that. And it's almost impossible to stand up when you have a spasm like that. I don't know if you've experienced that with the back. Oh, I have. Yeah. It's, it's, it's debilitating. Yeah. It's serious. But I, I would recommend if you ever get time to just look up anything, there's a documentary out. It doesn't necessarily get you psyched up, but um, there's a good documentary out there on tiger called back ironically. Um, and his journey back to winning the masters a couple of years ago, which or last year, which was one of the most incredible sports uh, I, Nick and I actually that day because Nick is a big Tiger fan we and this is why I love the fact that she's into golf she's like how about we just stay in we'll get some drinks I'll get like some dips some snacks and we'll just watch the final of the Masters and Tiger was not in first place we watched that whole four or five hours of him working his way up as a 40 some odd year old injured X star beating these you know big hitting uh, young guys on tour that are incredible, incredible. and just like the it was this win and his first win back when he was away from the game for like five or six years. I don't know if you've seen the scenes, but he had the whole gallery was just crowding around him. And you had like a thousand people walking up the 18th green behind him because of how impressive it was, you know, his return to the game at this age. And it's hard to win in your forties in golf. And then to oh. see him win in the masters, you know, the masters is the hardest competition to win. And to see him go from that to winning the Masters at 42 with some of the best players in the world. It's similar to um, Andy Murray. You know, Andy Murray is playing in a, in a time in tennis where any other time he probably would have had more wins, more, you know, titles. Um, and Tiger Woods is coming into a time where there are so many golfers that are just as good as he is if, you know, when he was in his prime. And it's just, I think it's, yeah, I gush about him, but I'm just a big fan of Tiger. And some people might give me shit for that, but I like Tiger. No, I love that. It's I find it so compelling those people that uh, are that driven. And like you said, it's the it like every other strength on the planet. Any strength in excess can be uh, a weakness. So uh, you know you can be too courageous 
and you can make stupid decisions. You can kill yourself if you're too courageous. So um, too much of anything is not a good thing. But um, yeah, did, did you watch the last dance with Jordan? No, I haven't. I, 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 I know is, it's unbelievable. Just as a, I would say, so Michael Jordan for me is probably the biggest uh, hero in sport growing up because I mm. played football to start with. Brian Giggs was my first hero. Yeah. Um, I think then Michael Jordan took over and it and it, it was a bigger influence on me because of his mentality and, and the person he was. Yeah. And so I'm biased from watching it, but from the people that I've ex suggested watch it um, and Lou watching it with me as well, you just get so much from watching it. This guy, it's so beautifully filmed. It's it's It was one of the best documentaries I've ever seen in my life. It's just so well captured. You've got like the Phil Jackson era and, and watching him and his coaching behind it. What happened with the Bulls behind the scenes? The, the behind the scenes stuff is fascinating, but you basically get to watch the tiger woods of basketball or the whatever of whatever sport what makes them tick and what goes behind the scenes and, and these events that came into the media what was actually he going through at that time this is at a time where there was no social media there's but but you know everyone in the world know who michael jordan was and what the impact was you know during the 90s on that and it was just it's a fascinating piece of um mm. filming they did a tremendous job with it and yeah he's his mentality is is ridiculous like it, it's he's probably the most competitive person that i've ever seen you know and it, it, it's like of the it's tiger woods ilk it's like i will destroy myself to beat you and i don't give a fuck about anything else i'm just gonna win and i've already won and it's like it's gonna happen and some of the games like the mind games he was playing and the stuff he was doing even with his um teammates and mm -hmm. He was fighting some of his teammates because they weren't trying hard enough and doing what he wanted. It's, yeah, I mean, mate, I I, I could not recommend that piece of TV. You know, if you like sport, yeah. you don't need to like basketball. You don't need to even know Michael Jordan. If you like sport, maybe not even if you like documentaries, you would love The Last Dance. It, it is fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I know I will like it and I haven't had a chance to. I think when I get TV time, it's not normally on my own. Um, and that's not something my wife would be into. I, I, I'm saving that for my next flight home, um, uh, okay. which, which will be in April. Or a, was actually flying to Turkey, hopefully, in, in February. Um, and I'm going to save it for then. So one of our subscribers actually watched it. Um, and he's not even he doesn't even watch basketball. He's British and doesn't know much about it and thought it was incredible. And that says something. If you don't even know the sport or know that no, you don't need to Michael Jordan, it's incredible. There was a, a story that came out about Michael Jordan after he retired. I don't know if it, somebody may correct me on this, but there was a young college player who was really good who was just bragging that he could take Jordan on uh, one on one. And it was at some sort of a charity event or I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to fill the, the blanks. I don't know what it was. But the story was going down the route of Jordan took him on one to one and just embarrassed him. Yeah, and Jordan, Jordan, That's it, Jordan, the whole the whole story was Jordan didn't just like beat him. Jordan no, embarrassed no. him, and he He'd was yelling at him the whole time. Yeah, and it was, he would. He it was a nonsense game. Yeah. yeah, it yeah, was yeah. a nonsense That's, one on one game. No, that mate Jordan was like one one clip. Can you remember Dan Marley? Can you remember Dan him? Marley. Dan Marley. Dan Marley. So. The the the, un, the underthrown of this of this um, uh, documentary is basically the last dance is the 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 chairman of I can't remember the the terminology like the uh, it's not the owner it's like the chairman was this guy that he, physical appearance isn't great he's a small guy not a particularly attractive looking bloke mm. and people don't like him he was like the businessman you know like the chairman in football it would be the kind, yeah. of, kind of same thing so he was in charge of. Um, um, Phil Jackson, who is reputed to be the best coach of all time. As general manager, maybe? Michael, might be the general manager. GM, right? yeah. So, so for whatever reason, he wants to take the balls in a different approach and isn't willing to sign Phil Jackson on for another year. He's like, this is the last year. Jordan is saying, I'll never play for anyone else apart from Phil Jackson. So if he's done, I'm done. And people are like, well, this might be, this might well be the last year that we see maybe, arguably, the best ever basketball team in history. So, Phil Jackson comes start of the season with a playbook that basically says, and it's titled the last dance. And he's saying, mm -hmm. guys, you need to know this team we have right now and what we've got right here. This might be the last time we're doing this. This we're going to go out in glory. This is our last year. 
it was like, oh god, I got goosebumps thinking about it. Mm. So this is the and now people don't like this general manager because he's looking at it from a business standpoint, not like looking after some of the other things that go into it. And you hear his side of the story, and it's you know it's interesting from that side. But my point being is that Jordan doesn't like this person, and he and he makes it fucking clear. Like his boss, his boss's boss, he's like taking the piss out of him in front of people constantly taking the piss out of the way he looks and his height and everything and um this guy wanted to sign dan marley so jordan caught wind of that and he's like i'm gonna fucking embarrass john marley i'm gonna smash him into the grave he's like, no 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 dan's mine i've got him for this game and he's like i knew jerry christ loved him and he's like i'm gonna make sure that i humiliated him in the game so it was just, like he's got <laughs> like you said it's not like oh let's just try and beat this team and get our equivalent of like the w no, no, no. It's like that W is already done. I'm going to embarrass this guy because I need to beat this guy so badly. I'll do anything to do what, you know, to what it takes. And you just see the clip of him going against Dan and just trying to humiliate him. Um, like I said, it was just like it's a different level of competitiveness. It wasn't yeah. like we've got to beat this guy. It was like I've just got to, I've got to have my foot, foot on his neck and I'm not going to release. Like you don't. You don't fuck around with Jordan. Like he, no. his his betting and everything that he would do with some of his teammates. He was just like he was a different level. And and, and so, like one person said to him at halftime, he had a really good half against Jordan and said something to him. Like you say something to Jordan, it was the worst thing you could do. It was like <laughs> you know where are you this half or something like that. I'm got he was guarding him. He was like, hey, it's not working out for you. you missed like eight shots or ten shots or whatever. And then Jordan broke a record, you know, or like did something ridiculous <laughs> in the second half where he was like, you what? Like he spoke, he, he kind of challenged him. You don't, with Jordan, you just stay quiet and hope that he's not on. Because if you say anything to him, like like that example of someone talked, someone talked about him when he, he was retired and he came in and he was like, where is he? It was like a fight. It's like, where is he? We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one now. It's like, oh, okay. you know, you want to say, like, no, we're going to play. He's like, oh, you were this. And he just, he would not stop talking to him. And he, he wanted to beat him into oblivion. And, and everyone was there to see it. Like, he just wanted him to know, like, I am top dog. No one fucks with me. And like, so you watch that stuff. Some people are like, oh, George's an asshole. He's a dickhead. And he's just like, he's a bit of a knob. You're like, yeah, he would be a difficult person to be around. But would you want him on your team or not? Like, he was just a pure winner. Yeah. And I cannot help but, absolutely love that stuff so any recommendations from our subscribers or people that they know that are like that i just yeah. i love it conor mcgregor's another one in ufc those people that have just got it and they back it up i i can't get enough of it yeah there's it was in, there was interesting to see i did it again um <laughs> <laughs> uh, i grew up watching basketball i grew up in that jordan era and and for me you could just he was he was a winner and you knew that yeah. everybody coming into the sport knew he was a winner. I, uh, being from Philadelphia, Sixers fan, and we brought in a player who had that driven mindset. Now he's not a marketable person. He he was one of the most incredible players I've ever seen play on the court, and he had that personality where he could beat anybody. And he was very vocal about taking on Jordan, and he was the only one who really got the best of Jordan Who's on this? the court. Allen Iverson. Oh, I know. I remember Iverson. Yeah. And Iverson, he he is he is a, a personality that he's he's um, a cult icon in Philadelphia now because he's so gritty. I'm surprised. Um, yeah. He but he he was vocal. I'm taking on Jordan, and he, when he got the chance, he he actually didn't. I think um, I'm trying to remember exactly because I'm trying to dig back into the old memory bank. But there, but, there were games and moments he had the better of him because he was six foot tall, but he could dunk and he was so fast. He well, was just lightning quick, wasn't he? This is this is a famous clip here. Um, I found this. Oh, the crossover, the, yeah, the crossover, and it was it was something. This was his first year, and he just wanted. And you could tell everybody stood back. Uh, when Allen Iverson, I remember this. See how everybody clears out, and Allen Iverson. This was his dream, and that is a clip that Allen Iverson is going to be known for, taking Jordan and just absolutely faking him out. Um, now, I don't think that that's the the whole story between Jordan and Iverson. There was. I'm curious what he see what he says there. You want to listen to that? Yeah, I'll listen to it. Let's. I, I need to take this off and on again. Because it's not, it's not Iverson didn't always have the best of Jordan. No. Um, De it, it, it's genuine. It was a different league. I think there's only really Kobe and LeBron you can talk at the same breadth, I think, with Jordan. 
um, I think, as far as competitive nature and yeah. what they were able to accomplish yeah. in their careers. I think Iverson is in the conversation if he won a title. Iverson, um, I would say, was was uh, better. He was capable of more than Kobe. Um, maybe not so much LeBron, um, but I think Kobe had a had a winning mindset, and he was he knew how to get the job done by incorporating the parts around him. Where I think Iverson was so. He, he was so trying to be Michael Jordan, um, but he didn't use the tools around him and he didn't motivate the tools around him to work with him in the same way. So I think Iverson had the physical attributes and he had the mental drive, but he, I don't know that he had the acumen to get that job done, if that makes sense. I, I think he may have, this is my two pennies worth, is that I think physically he, what, he was lightning fast, but he, he was six foot. He wasn't six foot six, six which foot is seven, tiny six foot eight, yeah. those guys, which is a big difference. And two, he, I don't know as much about his drive off the court, but I, 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 I'm not seeing that, but I do not believe he would have been as driven off the court as those three people were talking about. Those guys yeah. will do it. I, I don't think he was as professional. And now on the court, he isn't scared of anyone. He'll take them on. But there's a difference. Those guys have put the work in in training. They are they they aren't scared of anyone either. They'll do anything, but they'll put all of the work in the background and do go to the nth degree to make sure everything's kind of prepped. I'm gonna um, pull up two things on Iverson, which are interesting because he's 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 definitely not in the same league. And I'm not saying he is with Kobe or uh, LeBron, but I'm gonna play this, and then I'm gonna play something he's known for in Philadelphia, which I think defines what you're talking about, which is why Iverson never made it. Um, he's on the court. Iverson worked harder, as hard, if not harder than anyone. He was he was driven to win on the court. And I think the off the court thing is a fair point. But let's see what uh, I'm curious to see what this is. I have no idea what it's going to be. Very quick move. He goes Such an iconic move, though. He made that yeah. move. His cross, it's him. He crossed over. Yeah. Very quick. He hands the ball very well uh, with this crossover. Uh, they do allow him to. Uh, you know, pick the ball up and carry it pretty high. I figured that he wanted to come back to his right hand, but you know, by, he keeps the ball real low. And uh, he's small, and, and he's certainly closer to the ground than I am. So, I mean, his quickness is, is, is unbelievable. I went to a, a Charlotte game, and I was telling him how much I loved him and admired him and telling him how much he was my hero. And he was like, well, I couldn't have been too much of a hero to you if you crossed me like that. So <laughs> that was the only conversation we had about that. <laughs> Which I it, did you to me there was a difference in the way Scottie Pippen answered that question and Michael Jordan answered that question. Scottie Pippen and this is no knock on Scottie Pippen, but all I heard there was Scottie Pippen making up excuses for why he's getting beat by Allen Iverson, and <laughs> yeah. Michael Jordan said, "Yeah, he keeps the ball really low, and you know he, he's quick." He didn't make up an excuse that oh they let him carry the ball a bit too much. Um, but there's another clip that I think is going to help define Iverson. In what you're saying, I think there's something I'm going to show you that's going to back it up. And I don't know if you've heard about this. And he got a lot of shit in Philadelphia for this. Uh, I, I, I I watched something on him a long time ago, and I think I may have, um, which makes me like back up my. I know that's where my point comes from. That I miss practice. But he he um he was missing practices, and this is what it's about. And the the thing I will say about Iverson, um, why he's beloved. So he, he Philly is a tough place to to make it. He is he recovered. Um, he's he's very popular in Philadelphia. But this was I remember this coming out, and this is what I think you're Anybody finding. Anybody tell you that I miss practice? If if, if if a coach say I miss practice and y'all hear it, then that's that. I mean, I might have missed one practice this year, but if if somebody say he doesn't come to practice, it can be one practice. Out of all the practices this year, that's enough. If I can't practice, I can't practice, man. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I mean, simple as that. It ain't about that. I mean, it's, it's not about that at all. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but it's it's it's, it's easy to, to to talk about. It's easy to sum it up. When you just talk about practice, we sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player and we in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, we talking about a game, not a game. We talking about practice, not a game, not, a, not, not the game that I go out there and, and die for and play every game. Like it's my last, not the game. 
We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? I mean, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not, I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we're talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. We're, talk we're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice, man. When you come into the arena and you see me play, you see me play, don't you? You see me give everything I got, right? Absolutely. But we talking about practice right now. We talking about practice. Man, I look, I hear you. I, it's funny to me too. I, I mean, it's strange, <laughs> it's strange to me too. But we talking about practice, man. We're not even talking about the game, the actual game, when it matters. We talking about practice. Not you, but your how the hell can I make my teammates better by practicing? <laughs> I, you know, that's I guess what I'll say about Iverson. He's man, that he's guy's real. got. He's what's that? He is. He is who he is. He's real. He, I, I mean, one I, one thing I love about him is he wears his heart on his sleeve. In a way, he handled that really well. But it, on the other side of the coin, I think it showed some ignorance as to what the I, issue was. Well said. I agree. Yeah, I think it was. He's he's obviously likable because he's authentic, raw, hard on your yeah. sleeve type of guy. I love that. Just going to speak his mind, but by him doing so and opening that up, he was like, "How the hell am I going to make my teammates better by showing up to practice? By showing leading as an example of how, like Jordan, did he make everyone? He met. He demanded every single player was better because if he didn't, he'd be he would not stop." He would drive you out of the team. You get better, or you dr you're driven out. So yeah. that's how yeah. you do that. Like the greatest player in the world um, showed you how you can do that. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree with your statement there, mate. Interesting character, but uh, yeah, it, yeah, I, I love I love kind of throwing back and talking about these uh, these athletes and these characters. Um, you, you know, this this is why we watch sport. This is and it uh, there's something it's this dovetails really nicely with something I did want to mention and I know I've spoken about it to you before a few years ago and we we bring it back to football and we bring it back to effort so I can give Iris and shit for not being at practice but it didn't bother me that much at the time it bothered me because you aren't getting it it didn't bother me because I didn't think he was committed I had no doubt that Iverson would play with two broken legs if he could he, he was yeah. that kind of a player um, now, when we go back to football um, and connected to football, I was watching, um, it was the Chelsea match the other night. And I know I whine about this a lot. I'm just going to whine about it on public record now. You've heard me whine about this. And that's the feigning injury in football. It drives me batshit crazy because there has never been, in a, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I mean, maybe it does happen, but I've never seen a Premier League referee or an MLS referee for that matter. Um, call a foul, and then turn around and go, oh, oh, you're acting hurt. That's a red card. I'm going to give you a red card because clearly you're hurt. Because the second you get up and start running around, you're full of shit. And it's never changed the game. It's never done. The only thing, the only thing you could perceivably be getting out of it is maybe buying time. But it happens in the first five minutes of the game. It drives me bonkers. And I don't think you see those kind of players, even in, in the Premier League, those top players get up. They don't act like they're hurt. For the most part, like Lionel, Lionel Messi, and I don't think Ronaldo does too much, does he? Uh, yeah, he does. does he? Yeah, he, he. So he was he was renowned for like falling over very and like wince, oh, oh, and all that. Okay, the facial stuff. So he's renowned for it. Messi is the opposite. He would like, get taken out and get straight back up, and you, you wouldn't even you wouldn't see anything from him. He's a bit, to be honest, I, I think understandably in a way by being renowned as the world's greatest player may probably ever Messi. um mm. he's gone in a little bit more towards the prima donna stage and what i mean that is for his standards i'm not saying yeah. that compared to anyone else he's got because he must get the smoke blown up his ass on a daily basis yeah. like, like you know piled with it so he's yeah. got a little bit more like that but the Messi, even of a few years ago 
you'd see him taken out and get he'd just get grab the ball, pass it immediately and go. Like and and that's just so great to see that you know, yeah. like a, a top footballer um lead by example on that front. Ronaldo less so. He he would fall over a little bit more, unfortunately. But I don't mind the falling over. Uh, so there's there's a few things here. There's flopping, there's wincing and rubbing your leg and getting up. And then there's and I hate it because they there's a psychological thing where they cover their face because they know they're full of shit and they can't act like they're hurt because it looks bad. So they cover their head and then they roll around like they've broken their leg and it takes them about 30 seconds to get up, which I know, is that something Ronaldo would do? Um, yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, these uh, had examples. Um, of uh, This is back in United, so you class that now as earlier on in his career. Mm. People used to get a bit frustrated with him because he'd act up a little bit. But um, the pro- I haven't the seen him is- play that much. The the problem is, um, it's not Ronaldo. It's it's the um, it's the governing bodies like FIFA, FIFA and the FA that don't have any retrospective action towards it. It's not punished, and it, in fact, when they are taken down, they're rolling over. It looks more severe, so there are there is more likelihood the yellow card will come out, a red card, or even a foul, just because they are rolling over rather than people that are strong stronger willed and they'll try and stay on their feet and carry on aren't given free kicks when they maybe should be um because they haven't looked for the foul so unfortunately the incentives are there to reward people that are willing to go down so i come to come to the conclusion it's not their fault they're rewarded for it so mm. until they're not rewarded and they're actually punished for that behavior like you said oh you're all ro- actually you're rolling around i'm going to give you a yellow card now and reverse the decision because you're you're being unsportsmanlike you're not being a real mm you know, air quotes, yeah. man, and getting on with it. You know, that's why I love seeing the people that are hurt and carry on regardless and yeah. actually will try and, you know, limit the fact. He, do you know what? They'd say behind the scenes, he really hurt me, but I did everything I could not to show it. I love mm-hmm. that type of thing. Yeah. You know, so I, I think there's, a, for me, there's a distinction in in what I, because I, when we talk about people going down easily, there, there's, there's something that I can accept about going down easy. There's two reasons I think people go down easy. There's three. One of which um, is they're trying to draw a foul, Get and a foul. and yeah, and part of that is is you know they're so driven to an outcome, and I think Luis Suarez is a good example of this. That oh, if it yeah. means if it means getting uh you know getting a you know there's a small chance he's not going to get it. His his body will do whatever he can to score a goal. He's going to score a goal. He's going to get an outcome for the team. I don't care what it means. I'm going to get an outcome, and I'm going to go with my mind in that split second decision, the highest percentage opportunity and if that means falling over because somebody's got a piece of my shirt i'm going to do that i don't like it i can accept it because there's a certain mindset of professional athletes like tiger that they are they can be assholes they can be petulant and they have to get an outcome that's why they're there but there's the other side of the coin which i can live with so i'm an aston villa fan jack Grealish, for example um he he gets he flops a lot but he also jumps out of the way of a lot of slides because he gets tackled. He's so good or on the ball. He is constantly like, – that's a strategy, hack a jack. We're going to go in and we're going to knock the hell out of him. So if I was in his position to save my ankles, I'm going to be jumping in the air and protecting my important bits if somebody's sliding at me, even if it's not near me. Um, then there's the third piece, which I don't like, which I don't necessarily – I think there's an add-on to this where it's irrelevant, is the um, – the dramatics afterwards. So yeah. there's falling to the ground. Uh, I got hurt, but getting up fine. But it's the dramatics afterwards, in my view, I don't think makes a difference to the rest. If anything, I think it hurts their chances of getting carded like, or yeah. because it happens so often now refs are like, Oh, just get the fuck up. Just get up. You know? And that's, that's my whole view on it. And that's, that's my, my, my vent of the week. I was watching football and it was just like driving me bananas this week. It just, you know, when you see something and you think of it and you just keep looking for it. That was me this week watching football. And, and it's a culture thing. So if you watch Spanish football in particular, um, yeah. Italian is similar. The, uh, you know, the frustrations that we get with it, as I'm going to clash you as British here, as British fans, um, they're, it's more normal over there. So that's why it's kind of been brought over because you have those type of players that do it and they get away with it. And um, it's actually benefiting teams because of their actions. And yeah. we don't like it, but for them, it's just like, it's, oh, just do whatever it takes to win. It's what we do. It's like, you, you bend the rules, you do what you can. And it's our culture. We don't, we like to try and, 
be more fair game and sportsman sportsmanly like but um I, I may i can't watch spanish football uh you know because of that reason when i start seeing them falling on the floor every few seconds and wasting time and all those underhand tactics i'm just mm. that is not for me and my personality yeah. i hope they get smashed i i understand it though because there's a lot on the line and i think when you look at, compared to american sports there's no relegation and I think when you're looking at relegation, you're looking at business decisions. And if I'm the owner of a, of a British football club, I'm, I'm not going to go out of my way to tell my players to not try to draw a foul. So if, if, I'm, in a, if I'm in a cup final or if, you know, if, if, if let's say my team is uh, about to be relegated if they don't get three points and it's, you know, 90th minute and a player cheats to get a, get a you know, PK, as an owner, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I, I don't like it, but I understand it. Yeah, I, and uh, again, to reiterate my point, I don't think it's a problem for the players. It's their in, it, incentives are everything, and they are not incentivized um, enough not to do it. They are incentivized to do it. There are be- there are more benefits of doing it than there are risks to doing it. So why yeah. wouldn't they do it? And it's all, and it's. Me and you are getting frustrated with it, and 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 millions of other people that watch and love football. Um, but it's it's the it's the people that govern it and uh, that could take retroactive measures and say, look, clearly you you overdid it there. We're going to give you an extra yellow card or a suspension or a fine or something to try and kind of wash it out. But if they're not willing to do that, then it it sits with them. It's it's you know it's. Like I say, it's the it's the rules. The guys are pushing the boundaries, and they're getting away with it. So it's not it's not their fault. Mm. Well, mate, time has flown. By the way, I know. Yeah, I know. We're we're, we're about to time, and I think we need to uh, we need to call time on this week and uh, pick up next week. So, uh, really enjoyed it again. I'm I'm uh, yeah, looking likewise, forward mate. to looking forward to Batman. I think I think I might, and we can discuss this during the week. I think I might be doing the. Um, We'll see. I, I might flop around when the after show is instead of having a pre after show, actually having an after show. <laughs> so we yeah, have a bit more. Right. We have a bit more freedom than if we wanted to continue any points from the uh, actual show. Uh, we'll see how we go, though. I'll, I'll let you know how the uh, the process for the folks goes on release. So if, if you are listening to me jabber on, we're going to be releasing every Wednesday and Saturday. Uh, if you enjoy. Please like and subscribe uh, just to show us that we're doing things that you like uh, or comment below, positive, negative, the otherwise. Um, and like I said, next week, Batman, Hugo. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm well, up for, well up for Batman. I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to make you accountable now and say that if you're up for watching that documentary, The um, Social Dilemma, um, maybe we can discuss that and social media and life um on the after show you know what why don't we do a review of that yeah we could do we can we said don't don't do it here because it's something that we can do a, a proper review um and discuss it so maybe that'll be one of our our reviews we don't have to just stick to vintage reviews we can review the social network so i'll make it a point to watch it yeah. and then one week we can do that the social dilemma the social, social dialogue, dialogue is a different is a film. film. Yeah, I keep, yeah. I keep wanting to say that. <laughs> so I'll watch the social dilemma, and then maybe in the next couple of weeks we do um, uh, a show just going over that instead of just yeah, doing a okay, vintage mate. review. Take a take yeah. a week off from vintage reviews, but we're not stopping doing vintage reviews. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> all right, mate. Well, have a good week. All my love to your side, and uh, look forward to catching yeah. up with you next Sunday. Same to you, mate. Have a cracking week, and I'll uh, I'll see you next week. All right, take care, mate. Take, take care. Bye, bye.